Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Today we're going to focus on an amazing topic purpose. Maybe you think in this time of COVID-19 that you've maybe lost your purpose. For some of you, you're working super purposeful and others, maybe you feel like you're on hold right now. Wherever you're at, this show is going to encourage you because I had the privilege of interviewing Tanil and Graham Paulson and Tanil's an ER physician and Graham is a designer and you're just going to love their story and how they are on mission and on purpose even in this difficult time. So I hope this uh, show really inspires you to what is God calling you to do today, even in this crisis? We'll be right back. Well, today we have the privilege of having Tanil and Graham Paulson on the show. Tanil is an ER physician in the Halton region, and Graham is a freelance designer. Thanks so much, guys, for being on our show today. Hi, Lori. Hi, Lori. Thank you for having us. Tanil, I'm going to talk to you first. You're a medical doctor on the front lines in the ER in the middle of COVID. How are you coping, and what's your experience been like? Yeah, so definitely no one started off 2020 expecting to be in the midst of a pandemic. And certainly from a physician perspective, that wasn't really on the list for this year. Um, many, ma many different words could describe the experience, but I would say it's been surreal if I could pick one sort of word. Everything changed, everything changed kind of for everyone overnight, but certainly within the hospital, you have routines and ways of doing things. You have medical conditions that you um, understand to some extent and are learning more about. And this was something completely new on the horizon that no one knew anything about. Um, and, and all of a sudden, all the procedures that you were doing had changed in the way that you do them. Um, and you're worried, and I'd never been in North America worried so personally as well as professionally about everyone's worried about their families and bringing home this new um, illness, COVID. Um, so that's that's surreal and uncertain. And all of a sudden, we're thrown into a 24-7 of emails and updates and late night phone calls trying to change around our department, changing our shift times, trying to understand this new illness. So it's been a quite wild, unexpected experience for sure. I'm sure. I want to say on behalf of Canada, thank you, Tanil, to you and all the frontline workers out there. And really, you've taken risks that the rest of us have not had to take. So we sincerely thank you for what you're doing. How has your faith in Jesus sustained you, Tanil? I know your faith is so important to you. How's that sustained you through this time? You know, it is, Jesus has sustained me every day. And something that I landed on early in the pandemic is that um, that God's calling on my life to be a physician was way before the pandemic ever happened. And uh, there was a verse that I sort of adopted as my mantra. And it says, it's in Psalm 16, 8. And it says, he is ever present with me. At all times, he goes before me. I will not live in fear or abandon my calling because he stands at my right hand. And I knew that every day when I went into work, no matter the fear and uncertainty, and when I you know, would go and see and care for patients that I knew had COVID, and I had to put on all that PPE that everyone's hearing about face shields and gowns and masks, and there's always that moment of fear. Am I going to get this disease? What would that look like? Am I gonna bring it home to my family? Can I even go home to my family? And I would always land on, you know what, Lord, like you're, I, I'm living out the calling that you have for me and you are going before me into that room and you're beside me and you're with me every hour of every day. And, and that, you know, the Lord has sustained me for sure. That's so great. And I'm sure, Tanil, that your carrying, of course, the spirit of Christ every time you enter the room has influenced others around you to bring peace. Has Have you seen that happen? I have. I've had 
I've had lots of conversations, many, many conversations with um, different frontline workers, and I've been able to pray with some frontline workers because there's just been so much fear and anxiety and uncertainty amongst all of this. And as much as you see in the media with everything changing, it's, it's always constantly changing in the midst of our healthcare jobs as well. Um, and yes, so I've had a lot of opportunity to share. And one of the opportunities we had actually chatted about, Lori, is just that um, I was started even started a frontline support group, basically. We call it a supportive and encouragement group for frontline workers. And so we, I've had the opportunity to do that as well out of the pandemic. Well, I, that's so great. You told me that. And your sister, who is uh, in training, right? She's in the U.S. Yes. hospitals. And uh, that's so great that you're doing that because certainly we're using online to stay connected. But as, you know, frontline workers, uh, that's a wonderful ministry that you're doing. You're really birthing a ministry out of this. I want to bring, I want to bring Graham into the conversation because there's a very interesting story called the COVID box. And as a couple, God inspired you with an idea to create this COVID box to create protective barrier between the physician, physician and the, uh, the patient. So uh, I don't know whether you want to start, Tanil, with where the idea came from. And then Graham, we'd like to hear just how, what happened with that COVID box. Yes, yeah, so I, I can start with the initial idea um, in, the, in the early sort of days of the pandemic when we're um, all, as healthcare workers looking at other areas of the world and seeing this kind of march that we know is coming, something is coming. We don't know how big it's going to be. We don't know how bad it's going to be, but it's coming. And so there was a lot of um, innovative ideas in terms of protecting healthcare workers and protecting patients. And there was a physician that sort of came out of the um, pandemic in in the in Taiwan, a Dr. Lai, who actually worked at a Mennonite Christian hospital there. Um, he came up with the idea of the intubation box and he made the um, a public patent so that other people across the world could actually duplicate it or modify it for their own uh, needs in their hospitals. And so one night, uh, late at night, I received um, one of the many texts and emails in the day, hey, has anyone heard about this box? Um, in the department and so I was looking at it and I thought oh that's kind of neat and I kind of fell asleep mulling over it and I woke up at uh, five o'clock in the morning and I sort of say that God woke me up at 5 a.m. and I kind of sat up in bed and I thought oh Graham knows how to do a Graham's a designer he can do a lot of things and I and I thought I wonder if he can do it and I woke him up and I said hey remember there's this there's this box here's this picture do you think you can do this and and uh, he said yes <laughs> Wow. So what did you do, Graham? Well, yeah, that was kind of an early morning call, but we had a chance to look at the design that the uh, Taiwanese doctor had done. And then I just, we got inspired, you know, when you're on lockdown like this, you're really kind of itching to contribute somehow and give back somehow. So uh, I just called up a couple of my builder friends and we actually built a prototype right out of the garage just to test the local sizing that would work with the local hospital beds and, and what they do here. And then from there, we actually took it to another friend who's got a machine robotics shop, and he was able to really refine the design and uh, create something that we could make uh, more copies of. And so from there, we've just been able to um, come up with a local design and connect with other people. You know, I always say it's, um, it's, it's fun to do uh, innovative work or, you know, some new work, but it's always better together. But what's even better is doing your work as unto the Lord. So uh, when, you know, doing these kind of things is really how we live for God and live for people. We're thinking about the people that we're going to bless with this and protect with this and uh, give the healthcare care workers uh, more confidence to boost their confidence. But we're also thinking about the people that we're doing these with and working alongside. Right. So, um, yeah, just being able to bless uh, the healthcare care workers and support them was a, a lot of fun uh, just to be able to do that through this project. And, and thankfully, um, Thankfully, uh, we're all blessed, really, because our, our province is not in a full-blown crisis, you know, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Spirit's voice and for taking action, Graham. I think that's the lesson of the day, isn't it? That whatever God prompts us to do, we do it to, I like your family's motto, love for God, love for people. Did I get it right? Yes, close. Living for God, living for people. <laughs> well, loving, living, I knew it was something loving like that. And, but... Loving and living. <laughs>
That's so great. Yes. That's really great. I think that's the motto of the day, and I think that's a call for all of us. I thank you to Neil. Uh, God bless you and protect you in the front lines. And Graham, as you come alongside to Neil and serve hospitals with the COVID box, many blessings to you and your family. Thanks for taking the time today to chat with us. Thank you so much for having us. Well, next, a wish comes true for Paige. You don't want to miss it. She was involved uh, in a lot of performing arts and dance. So when her knee was aggravated and uh, getting a little swollen, we took her to the doctor and he said, well, it's probably, you know, because of all the dancing she's doing and, you know, perhaps it's growing pains and so forth. But it just didn't go away and it was a strange pain too. After several x-rays and several appointments and finally an MRI, you know, we, we learned that there was a small tumor there that had to be investigated and a biopsy had to be done. It was about a week of waiting. Then they, the doctors told my, my family that it was Ewing sarcoma, which is um, a bone, bone cancer. 20 years ago, uh, Ewing sarcoma was treated with amputation and uh, there was a very low survival rate. So it's just before my 11th birthday when I found out that I had cancer. It's a very difficult emotional ride to understand that your child is very, very sick. And um, the medicines and the drugs that are required for um, cancer are, are very toxic. My whole world started to be kind of plucked apart. Everything that I had known um, just started to, to kind of fall away into this new world of cancer. Just the realization of what was being uh, injected into my daughter's little body was horrifying. I could no longer walk on my leg. I would have to lose my hair. I would have to get blood transfusions, platelet transfusions, everything to try and build my system back up to receive the next chemo. I felt uh, very angry with God initially um, because why would he let this happen to a child? So I would get seven chemotherapies and then um, a surgery to replace the bone in my leg where the tumor was and then seven more chemotherapies. I mean, I gladly would have traded places with my daughter. I would have taken all of it. Why did this happen to me? Like, what did I do to deserve this? I thought God was punishing me. When we're young, you know, you kind of think you're invincible and whatever, you can get it together later. And scripture says, you know, you're not promised tomorrow. Your life is a mist. And so those realities began to sink into me and began to really just make me desire to live differently. And so that's when I, you know, talked to God and said, look, <laughs> if you, if you <laughs> get me out of this, if you allow me to live, then I don't want to waste this time. When Paige was in the hospital, uh, she was visited by a gentleman named Woody. He wrote songs about hospital food, feeling sick, feeling bad. And he was just a great uh, entertainer for the kids and spirit lifter for the kids. One day around Christmas time, he just came in and said, hey, I've got some Christmas songs. Do you want to sing a couple with me? And um, singing, that was something I hadn't done in months because I've been so sick. My sister Jenna and my mom were there and they really encouraged me like, come on, let's just sing a song with him. So I sang the song, Mary Did You Know, with him as he played the guitar. It was so freeing. I could sing still. I still had a piece of me that, I still had a piece of me <laughs> that I used to, and, um, and the cancer hadn't taken everything. And he recorded Paige in the hospital room, uh, took it home and had a, a friend add some tracks to it, and they produced a CD of Christmas music we had kept it a secret from my dad because I wanted to give this to him on Christmas Eve. Um, he had actually been looking for a way to express our thanks to so many people who had been supporting us and praying for us. And so he was like, you know what? We're gonna make hundreds of copies of this thing and send it out um, as a thank you to people. We were just floored at how many people just were so thrilled to get the CD. I couldn't believe. Um, just the impact that it had, and that's really what got me thinking about doing music and saying, you know what, I want to help people. I want to, you know, truly just focus on 
ministering to people and encouraging them. About halfway into my treatment, um, all of a sudden we get a call from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They basically ask me the question, um, if there's anything in the world that you'd like to do, what would it be? Whoa, I don't know. Um, so I you know, threw out a couple ideas of meeting a celebrity or I don't know, your, your mind just goes blank, which is silly, but it does. And my parents and I were kind of talking about it. We realized that we need to be thinking bigger. And that's when God kind of tapped us on the shoulder and said, remember Woody, remember that little CD and how you just did it in your hospital room, yet all the people that it impacted. What if you did a, a real CD? What if you did real songs in a real recording studio? So um, my wish was to come to Nashville from my home in Pennsylvania and record a professional CD. It took almost a year for the Make-A-Wish people to set that up, but they had never had a request like that before. They never said, pick a second thing in case we can't do this. Uh, they just, they dug in and, and they worked on it. And it was the perfect timing because by the time they called and said, we've got your wish set up, I had been able to be a year off of my treatments. I had been able to learn to walk again. And my hair had been growing back. And so I was just ready more than ever to go on this wish trip and to sing with more strength and more fervor than ever. So after that was all done, we came back, put the CD together. We just kind of sent it out again to people who had been supporting and encouraging me. And this one just went so much further. All of a sudden, we were receiving calls for me to sing and speak at people's churches. Um, for me to share my testimony. Make-A-Wish, when they heard the CD, they were just like, this is awesome. We want her to come, you know, speak at our events. So I started speaking at these high-profile business events where um, the businesses were supporting Make-A-Wish. So I was the wish kid there, getting to sing my Christian songs about the Lord and share my testimony of going through cancer and how God got me through and um, healed me. And so it was just like this domino effect of opportunities that just erupted out of this wish CD. I love that we can um, bring about so much good through our trials that we never could have imagined when we were going through them. Everything that I thought was taken away from me was actually just being preserved and grown, only for God to just give it right back to me in the most abundant, beyond what I could imagine way possible. I don't know if there has ever been a time when our nation and the world needed a miracle more than we do right now. Get Pat Robertson's latest DVD, Do You Need a Miracle? In this DVD, you'll discover God's awesome power at work today, featuring incredible true stories of divine intervention. God showed up and he worked miracles. Different doctors would come in, it's like, wow, you're a miracle. I knew God had restored him. We've also gathered teachings that will be especially helpful to you with what we're facing today. Why it's so important to believe God and build our faith. And this program is going to help you do just that. Conquer fear, find hope, and be encouraged. Get Do You Need a Miracle? Available now. Veteran Hollywood stuntman Will Harper has always had a need for speed. There's just an excitement to it. You know, maybe for some people they would just get terrified or the adrenaline would make them almost sick. But the way I'm wired, it just feels good. It's exhilarating. As a teenager, he started racing motocross. By the time I was 18, I had actually won a, a pro championship locally here in Southern California. And I felt like I was on my way, and a lot of people said, man, you're going to be world champ. You, you got it. It was a sense of accomplishment. I think I wanted to do it better than anybody else. I wanted to be somebody. Racing took a toll on his body, and injuries forced him to retire at the age of 25. I was angry at God. This isn't fair. It's not right. I tried so hard, and I had so much promise, and it was just dashed on the rocks. Around this time, a friend offered him work doing motorcycle stunts in movies and television. 
I still had good skills and I didn't have to win a race. All I had to do was ride well enough to get a shot, which I could do that easily and um, quickly became a top uh, stuntman in Hollywood. The A-Team TV series, I double Sylvester Stallone and Rambo are the first First Blood movie. While working on the movie The River with Mel Gibson, he found out how dangerous stunt work really was. I'm beating the windshield out as they're driving in about five miles an hour, and then I jump up to go after Mel, and the guy next to him is supposed to throw me off, and, and six stunt guys are running to catch me. They got all fired up, and they knocked my safety guys out of the way. I bounced off one of them, went right under the truck, and I got those door rears right over my chest, and it sounded like dried twigs snapping. It was horrible. I knew I was dead. Amazingly, Will survived, but now too banged up to do stunts, he needed something to give him purpose. So he started racing stock cars. He also married and he and his wife started a construction business. At this point, I thought, okay, well, maybe if I'm rich, you know, if I make a bunch of money, I'll be happy. He soon found out that money wasn't enough. A darkness came into my life. My older brother died, 40 years old. My racing just tanked, it was weird. My first wife, she and I were involved with the construction, but I really didn't like her, I didn't like construction, I didn't like anything. Searching for answers, he went to a friend to talk things out. His friend smoked crack, and after a few beers, Will made a fateful decision. I said, you know what, give me that pipe. And he's like, no, you don't wanna do this. And I said, no, give it to me, and I, I started smoking crack right then and there. It just took me like a rocket ship to the moon. Unfortunately, with that stuff, the next thing you know, you're like a free-falling safe going to hell. That drug is like nothing else because in a matter of six months, I didn't have a wife, I didn't have two race cars, a hauler, an ocean racing boat, or a house, or anything. For the next 10 years, Will used and sold crack. He also married and the two stayed high. He moved his family to Montana to get a fresh start but soon started using and selling crystal meth, and police took notice. I had a premonition that we were gonna get busted, and I left the house, and my wife went back there. I told her, don't go back there. I'm telling you, we're getting busted. And, and um, she went back, and the cops pounced on her, and she got arrested, and our baby Will, he uh, got into protective custody. And so I'm hiding out. I don't know what to do. They've got her, they've got my baby, and they're looking for me. While riding in a friend's car, Will says he had a vision. I could see myself at Woodside Market. It's just like I'm watching a video. And I'm getting arrested. And I'm standing there with all these cops around. Will knew the vision came from God. God's the only one that truly knows the future. I remember seeing something very strange at that time. I told the girl, I, I said, you know what, just go to the Woodside Market. If I get arrested how I told you, that's God's answer for me. And the very first car that drove by was a Ravalli County Sheriff. It was just like somebody pointed me out because he just looked me right in the eyes and pulled in there. And the next thing I know, I'm handcuffed and all these cops are there and I'm seeing the exact scene that I'd seen in my mind. Will faced a 100 year prison sentence. And by now he and his wife were divorced. But he knew that somehow God had a purpose in his arrest. You know, God, I always believed in you but I never thought you were quite this personal. And I said, just tell me what to do. You know those vacancy, no vacancy signs that flash, their little tube fluorescents? I could see that in my head going, read the Bible, read the Bible. For four months, Will studied the Bible. And one day, I was reading about Jesus on the cross and he just died and the centurion said, this is an innocent man, this is the son of God. And right at that moment, I just burst into tears, and all of a sudden, I got born again and saved right there on the spot. I, I knew who Jesus really was. It wasn't just words. I had an understanding for the Bible. I went from hating it to loving it. Will was discipled by a local pastor that worked with inmates. Also, the judge reduced his sentence to only two and a half years. It was so overwhelming in so many ways, and I felt his love. And I felt free for the first time. Um, and I truly was free. He was released on parole and he called his brother Tom, who was also in the film industry. The two hadn't spoken in years. Today, uh, if you 
if you want to, you know, you could come work on Iron Man 2 if it's okay with your PO. And so I asked, and they said, yeah, that would be all right. I get a travel permit. Will still works on movies with his brother. He's also back to racing motocross. In time, he reconciled with his son. And now the thrills and his purpose come from a different source. Don't get me wrong, the stunt business is incredible. It's exciting. The motorcycles, it's all exciting. But it's nothing compared to working for God. Working for the creator of the universe, I mean, it's a privilege and an honor, but it, it's, it, to me, it just does something inside my heart. When I got born again and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, up till that point, it seemed to me like everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong in my life. And now, I embrace the day, even the hard days. I'm excited about life. What a difference. What a difference a Savior makes. Wow, what a powerful testimony. When you look at Will's life, it does look like an action-adventure movie. But his real life story is a, uh, a testimony of the power of God. You know, he was angry at God when he saw one door close, and then he opened another door for Will. As he went through that door, he also felt that he could still maintain and keep his, his the control of his own life. But the reality is, none of us are in control of our lives. But I love what he says at the end. What a difference. What a difference a Savior makes. Have you made that choice today? I want to lead you in a prayer. And it's a prayer of faith, and it's called the sinner's prayer. But if you're ready to make the change today, I believe that God is ready to do a, a miracle in your life. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I surrender. No longer me, but you in charge. I confess my sin. I turn from doing things my way, and I choose to do it your way. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, one 759 700 Prayer partners are standing by. And you know, that's why we're here every day, five days a week, just to declare that Jesus speaks today. But we need your help to continue this mission. Would you join arms with us for just $20 a month or your best gift? We would love to get to you. Do you need a miracle? It's a powerful tool, and it'll help you stand on the Word of God and move through these uncertain times with confidence. 1-855-759-0700, prayer partners are standing by. And it would be such an encouragement if you do that now. I want to leave you with a power verse. It says in Isaiah 25 and 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Hold on to that. Until next time, we love you. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. 